Bill Gross with us in Mohammed. Thank you so much for having us out here. Thank you for coming. Um, what have you learned in 2011? What's a single thing as you close out the year, you fight to get to the end of the year? What's What's been the learning experience for you this year? I, I think we've learned, Tom, that policy makers are most important in these types of markets. I mean, we've seen policy in terms of Operation Twist. We've seen policy in terms of the, the lack of fiscal spending and, and the move towards stringency, all of which have affected not only bond markets but equity markets. So follow the policymakers to the extent that you can going they, forward. They intrude, they intrude in spades, Mohammed. What have you learned in your travels? You're in Germany, I know, I believe Kuwait recently. What have you learned uh, this 2011? A couple of things. One is that the Europeans have taken a long time to understand the depth of their issues. And the other thing I've learned is that the rest of the world is standing there puzzled, puzzled as to how Europe and the U.S. can be having so many difficulties. And that's important, Tom, because we all live in a world where the core is the West, and the rest of the countries depend on this core, and they are seeing this core weak. So what I learned is that people are unsettled, they're confused, and hopefully we're going to have some anchors restored. With, with Fareed Zakaria, you were uh, this weekend and with CNN, or I think of now Ferguson's uh, work as well, a hub-and-spoke world or a new America. Mohammed, are we going to see a shift in IMF votes soon? Is that the price Europe is going to pay? I hope so, because part of the problem that the IMF has is that it's not viewed as credible and legitimate enough. And, bec and part of that is because Europe has all the votes compared to the developing world. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is a slow process, but hopefully it will get accelerated. Right. And we need the IMF. We need a conductor to help organize what is increasingly very conflicting policy measures at the regional and national level. Uh, dreaded first chart on Italy, of course. And Bill, I want to go to you on Italy rather than uh, Mohammed. Monty considers uh, the two year, and you can see the spike up there. That's the emotion of a few days ago, exit Berlusconi. And we got a little bit of a bounce up today. Why should American investors care about Mohammed El Arian's world? Well, they should care because the growth in the United States, at least, is, is significantly a function of what happens in Euroland. They're a large trading partner. The financial obligations in terms of the banks and the connectivity there, you know, is significant. And so what happens in Euroland, yes, it, right. it doesn't stay in Euroland. It goes over to the United States. Another chart here. Per capita in Italy. We showed this chart a few days ago. I think it's absolutely remarkable. Uh, the idea of a flattening out in Italy, and you can see, Mohammed there, uh, the slowdown of 75, the slowdown of the 90, and then we just roll over. This is this new normal, obviously accentuated in Italy. Have you been surprised, Mohammed, at the real economy speed, the speed of changes that we've seen in the last 18 months? We haven't been surprised for two reasons. One is that we had a sense that we as a society would have to pay back for all the overborrowing and overleveraging. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and this chart is a critical chart that you've just shown, right? We're now catching up with the reality of slow growth for a long time. So part of Europe's problem is that it hasn't been growing enough for years, and therefore deleveraging safely their economy is proving to be very difficult. I saw, I spoke rather, Bill, with uh, Andrew uh, Balls today from your London office. Can you invest in Europe now? Is it a PIMCO strategy in your meetings to take advantage of that crisis and find value, whether it's in equities or in better quality bonds? Well, we can in the cleanest uh, dirty shirts, as we call them. Is Netherlands them. a cleanest dirty shirt? It's uh, it's on the borderline. It's headed for the Netherlands laundry, is on the borderline? But it's, but it's close. Uh, you know, and it's not that liquid uh, Germany. Break exclusive Bill Gross <laughs> banned from Amsterdam. Okay, continue. Germany obviously qualifies. France, perhaps. Mom and I have uh, mild disagreements there. But uh, the other countries are at risk from the standpoint of spread, from the standpoint of investors' perception of growth, and from the standpoint of the ECB and their willingness to move all in. They certainly haven't done that. They didn't do that today with $2 billion worth of purchases uh, in terms of Italy. Let's ignore Mohammed. The Jets lost. Your San Francisco 49ers have turned it around in 12 months like nobody in sport. Are we all doom and gloom about Europe and to both of you, can they turn it around like the, the 49ers? Well, they can. They have to get together. They're dysfunctional. They're a family that doesn't function well, and that's obviously because the fiscal and the monetary authorities you know, are not co-joined. They can't get together and agree on things. Germany wants to do it their way. Greece wants to do it its way. And so mm -hmm. uh, there's never a, a total agreement. There's never a significant change. It's always ad hoc and at the margin. Well, what is the institutional solution? here then other than Lagarde to the rescue how does Europe get its act together it's about Germany Tom Germany needs to make a decision 
It needs to decide, does it want a fiscal union with greater political integration? And the model I have in my mind is what West Germany decided about East Germany. West Germany said it will be a fiscal union with political integration. Yes, there's a big mm -hmm. bill, but we're willing to pay it. Or does Germany opt for a smaller, less imperfect union of countries with similar condition. Germany holds the key. Germany needs mm. that to make that decision. We are at Newport Beach with Mohamed El Arian and Bill Gross. Mohamed, a little more in Europe, and I want to get to Bill's uh, world. I want to bring up a really important chart. This is the litmus paper that we use on the show of the tension in the short-term uh, market. Let's bring up elegant chart one. Okay, folks, live. This is way too much math for a Monday. Eurobor OIS, three month paper. The yellow line is a U.S. paper, and you can see that the European paper on the right side has jumped up, the tension there. But uh, Bill Gross, U.S. LIBOR and those spreads jump up as well. Compare the tension in short-term bank paper in Europe versus here. Well, much more tense. Um, you know, the spreads are much wider, which indicates much, much more of risk or perceived risk, at least in terms of the banking system. Obviously, there's an interchangeable flow between dollars in the United States and dollars in Euroland, and, and to that extent, it helps. But there's a, a much greater risk in the banking system at the moment. I, I can see in your, your books, you got your book display back behind you there. Oh, When Markets Collide was the name of that book, movie, Christmas 2012. When Markets Collide talks about the risk you need to focus on, what is the risk to both of you that we need to focus on in the bond market now when you look at the politics of uh, El Arian's world? Well, the risk in the bond market, certainly in the cleanest dirty shirt bond markets, let's talk about treasuries, it, it is that they're artificially suppressed. Everyone knows that. There's a twist. There's a, a, a two-year period of time in which the Fed basically will stay at 25 basis points. All of that basically produces a 10-year uh, treasury at 2%. Mm -hmm. That's a artificial yield. The question becomes how long will it be artificial? And so what we're suggesting is it will probably be artificial for a number of years. The real risk comes at the long end of the 30-year Treasury where investors wonder what will happen right. when QEs disappear. One more question. I want to get Mohammed in here. Have you been a victim of financial repression this year? Well, I think we all are. Uh, to the extent that real interest rates are negative, that basically means that investors in the bond market and ultimately in the stock market cannot keep up with purchasing power. That's mm -hmm. what financial repression does. It basically takes money from savers and basically reallocates it to the government's balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And so all investors going forward, to the extent that real interest rates stay negative, to the extent that that's a, an example for equity markets in terms of valuation, it means that investors will only earn you know, lower rates of return relative to inflation than they have in the past. And then to your politics, Mohammed, how should politicians adapt to this new normal world? They're not used to it yet. We see Berlusconi out, Papandreou out, Sarkozy a challenging election coming up. How do they adapt to Bill Gross? world. First and foremost, they have to realize that this is structural in nature. This is not a cyclical world. These are fundamental changes that are going to be with us for a while. And they have to think structurally, which they've failed to do. I think the second thing all of us have to realize, Tom, and something that I worry about a lot, is that we are changing the dynamics of markets. We are a market-based economy, and the dynamics of markets are changing. You see this in terms of shifts in the demand curve. Italy, for example, is starting to lose its investors for a long time. Mm -hmm. They're not going to come is back. Is there a run on the bank in Europe right now? I, don't think, I think there's a real concern about banking fragility, and lots of people have stepped back and said, let's wait to see how this plays out. We also have to be concerned about how the, the landscape is going to change. You know, the banks in this country are being turned into utilities over time. So we are going through something very fundamental where the function of, of markets itself is going to change as we go forward. And politicians have to understand that, and all of us have to understand that. What institutional solution would you like to see in Europe now, or for that matter, in the U US? Which, which institution has to come to the rescue? I think two have to come. First, you need a circuit breaker. You need to calm things down. Every day, there that's are the ECB. two. That's the ECB. Only institution has the balance sheet to do that. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, Germany, as I mentioned earlier, has to come up. 
they both have to step up to the plate. One mm -hmm. short term, the ECB is a bridge, but it's a bridge right. to a stronger union, which is Germany. Here's the fear of so many of our viewers that are, are savers. Let's bring up this chart. This is a chart that really distressed me. I ran a regression back a good 20 years, and then we zoomed in. This is from 1985, uh, below the 1985 trend moderation, and you can see us back 10 years. I'm only showing this to impress the PIMCO people that we are mathy. <laughs> We're doing logarithms in the next half hour with Kashkari. Anyways, here's the regression, and it is the great moderation. Bill, what says that you're wrong, and this just continues, and we go back to those sub-3% nominal yields that we knew in the 1930s and well, the 20s? Well, I think it can, Tom, as, as long as the Fed and as long as the Treasury and, and combination, you know, have this, um, I'll buy them one day and, and uh, you sell them the next, to the extent that there's financial repression and that it produces a 2 to 3 percent yield for the 10-year, for instance, mm. and, and inflation, which remains relatively benign, which uh, does not force right. the Fed to raise interest rates, then we can see that. And it, you, can, you can produce returns by what we call rolling down the yield curve, by buying a five-year, letting it mature over 12 months to a four-year, and producing not a 1 percent yield, but a 2 percent type of yield. So it, it it's, it's significantly important as to whether we stay here. We may remain at 2% yields, but you can produce more than that right. simply by rolling down that yield curve. You're building a 20-story building here. You're expanding in New York and London, and uh, there, there is a success to this shop. When you look for people to hire, both of you, what do you look for? What is the attribute or distinction of these best and brightest when you make that choice among 20 candidates, what is the thing, Mohammed, that you look for? First, we look for what we call the best athlete. Um, PIMCO has been very good at bringing in somebody and then finding new positions for them on the team and finding that they excel. In fact, some of the people you're going to talk to are excelling in new positions. So we spend a lot of time looking for best athlete. The second issue we look for is putting people together in teams. PIMCO functions according to teams, not, in, not individuals, but teams. And there, we need the basic combination, Bill has often written about it. You need someone who's an economist on that team. You need somebody who's a mathematician on that team. And you need someone who has street instinct, gut instinct about markets. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do is make sure that we have these individuals put together in teams so that we can go out there and earn returns for our clients and manage their risk. And I think common sense is a, is a neglected ingredient. Really? Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it, it's hard to find common sense and, and to basically mm -hmm. interview it uh, for it. But right. intelligence, to my way of thinking, is a significantly overvalued um, the quantity. Uh, we need a CQ in addition to an IQ. Put them together and you've got a great investor. Well, thank you so much, both of you. We're going to continue on here. Mohammed Alarian and Bill Gross uh, with us.